briefly, let's go through the armies of 40k and talk about the 10 that are perhaps struggling the most at the moment. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where recently we talked through some of the top 10 factions of the game and the things that made them strong. Following a few requests on that video, I thought we'd do a counterpart video to cover some of the armies that are struggling most in the game. So today we're going to go through the top 10 weakest factions and talk about their overall performance and strengths and weaknesses. Before we start, just a little bit of explanation. I would bear in mind that 40k only has around 20 to 30 primary codexes, depending on exactly how you count them. The number of actual factions can be a bit murky depending on how many different supplements that we're talking about. For this video, I thought we'd have the more divergent Space Marine chapters as their own entries, but lump the Codex ones into one selection. I'd also bear in mind that just because armies feature on this list doesn't mean they're unplayable. A lot of them are maybe a bit under the power curve, but I feel that compared with just about any point in 40k's history, these guys are doing better than they would be before. Throughout the vast majority of 9th edition, you'd see entire stretches of tournaments where it was only won by the top maybe 3 or 4 factions, but pretty much most of this list are still winning multiple grand tournaments over the past few months, and that just wouldn't have happened previously. Obviously they could use a bit of help, but I still feel that a good player playing the army to the max will have a really good chance, at least with most of these, some of them are obviously harder than others. As mentioned for this list, I thought that I'd group the Codex Space Marine chapters together in their one entry, and have the individual Divergent Space Marines each as their own. Always a little bit of a murky line that one, depending on how you divide them up. I think that grouping does make a fair bit of sense though, as it pushes you in different directions for list building. Just a fair warning, there will be quite a lot of Space Marines mentioned in this one. The folks in the power armour aren't doing so well right now, despite their armour of contempt and things. Finally, as with the previous one, there's various different ways to assess how well they're doing in-game. With this one, we're going to be looking at tournament data for GTs, roughly over the last couple of months' worth of data. We'll go through in the order of tournament win percentage, starting with the higher ones and going down to the lowest, but we'll also talk about grand tournament wins in Nephilim, and how regularly people are choosing to play each faction. I'd say the win percentage is the most useful of those three, but the GT wins does kind of show how well an army can compete at the very highest level against other top lists and how often they're played does correlate with how good an army is, though it has to be taken in context of how many people will play the army otherwise. Say for example, there's a ridiculous amount of Space Room players, but say very few Gene Stiller Court or Drukhari players by comparison. In any case, let's get into it, and I thought we'd start with a couple of bonus entries, armies that were only just above the cutoff for the top 10. First up, and 12th weakest army in 40k by win percentage are the Gene Stiller Courts, Realistically, that puts them kind of in the mid-tier. Their win percentage is 48%, they've won two grand tournaments in Nephilim, and being a pretty niche faction, they aren't very well played at the moment. In fact, it looks like they're the fifth least played faction in all of 40k, so not a lot of followers of the Thor Armed Emperor are choosing to put them on the table. Currently, they perhaps feel like an army that's got a ton of really quite clever and sometimes game-breaking tricks, but that's kind of balanced out by having data sheets that don't have a lot of raw power on them, just for the points that you pay for the stats. Generally their units tend to need to aim to pop up, inflict some horrendous damage, and then try and hide as best they can, because they're usually quite easy to kill in return. I feel it makes the faction a fairly high skill faction at the moment. They've got a lot of clever things that they can do, but you really need to choose the right ones, and small mistakes can be punished pretty big with getting the army hoovered off the board. In terms of their greatest strengths, things like pop-up units that can inflict massive damage either at range or melee, either Acolytes getting into combat, or pure strain gene stealers doing the same, or big blocks of Acolytes with seismic cannons and things, making use of the plus one to hit and wound from crossfire. All of that's backed up by a strong cast of supporting characters, some damage dealers like the Kelomorph, and plenty of buffing ones like the Primus, and their innate cold ambush rules means that they can be quite hard to screen, so they can often pick up secondary points quite easily, jumping in behind the enemy and jumping onto objectives. In terms of common choices in top lists, Twisted Helix remains pretty popular if you build round melee. That one gives you extra strength and extra movement and things. In general, it seems that custom cults using shooting type builds tend to be a little bit more popular these days, particularly enjoying their industrial efficiency to ignore the penalty on their heavy rock weapons. I'd say a big unit of pure strains with the ability to first turn charge with one of their proficient plannings is a very good include as well. And the winning list was interestingly very, very biker heavy, taking absolutely tons of those Aslan Jackals, which are just an efficient unit all round. Obviously, they have their issues though. Games Workshop basically confirmed that changes will be coming for them in January to try and make the faction a bit more balanced. I'd expect some sort of buffs to things like Aberrant and Abominance, and hopefully more besides. Moving on, and just outside the top 10, we have our second bonus entry of Orcs. Their win percentage is 47%, again certainly not too terrible, a kind of a lower mid-tier army now. 
and they have had a bit more success at GTs, winning four of them, and are far more popularly played than Gene Stealer Colts, Orcs are just a very popular faction for 40k in general. To be honest, I'd kind of say that 10th most played is actually slightly low for them. If they were a bit stronger, I'm sure we'd see lots more people putting them on the board. In terms of getting the best out of the faction at the moment, they do have a fair few raw strengths. The new war gives them inball saves across the army, and that's pretty nice as a durability boost for a turn or two. In general, they've got high toughness values across their army, plenty of melee attacks on just about everything, ranged or not, and some decent enough psychic powers like jumping boys round the board with dad jump. Currently, the go-to way to play Orcs does seem to be Goths with Gazgul. The units chosen do perhaps tend to be a little bit on the same side. Squig Hog boys usually make an appearance, as do Killregs, leading a few boys, maybe some tooled up bosses, and perhaps some battle wagons to transport some non-beast snagger stuff. The Warspawn Blaster Jet planes are also pretty useful, with just their raw damage output. For other builds, you can try and make Orc shooting work, building around a fast and hard-hitting speed mob. It can struggle just a little bit on the secondaries, though or maybe doing free booters for the plus one to hit for their ranged guns. As for downsides, I would say that their internal balance isn't great. I just feel like an awful lot of the Orc Codex is sort of okay, but a bit meh. As for other faction weaknesses, morale hurts them quite a lot. Any modifiers to shooting will ruin their already bad ballistic skill. And while a lot of the models have high toughness values, they do tend to suffer chip damage at just about every exchange with the enemy. Their saving throws aren't particularly strong. Overall, definitely not unusable, but just a little bit behind the top dogs. Moving into the top 10 proper now, we have Chaos Knights in 10th place. They're also on a 47% win percentage and have won 5 grand tournaments in Nephilim so far. A bit less played than Orcs, they're still quite popular. They appear to be 12th most popular at the moment and slightly less popular than the Imperial Knights. It is interesting that throughout Nephilim, they started off at least fairly powerful in terms of win rate. They seem to be gradually dropping further and further as time goes on. I think they were initially around about 50% on average, and now some of the more recent weeks seem to have been having them drop down to something like 45 or so. Maybe a little bit surprising, seeing as Chaos have arguably got a bit of a buff, seeing as they can soup in a whole load of demon flamers now. I do wonder maybe if Chaos Knights doing that tend to be declaring themselves as a general Chaos list rather than a Chaos Knight list, and that's one of the things that are affecting the stats. Perhaps the raw Chaos Knight players that don't bring along souped flamers are just at a bit of a disadvantage compared with those that do. In any case, Chaos Knights are far from a tame army and they've got lots of things going from them. Generally chunky and dangerous units with a lot of raw power and stacking buffs. Demon favours are quite nice and particularly gives you some nice survivability on the big knights and the ability to potentially get back up from the dead. The dread abilities are maybe a bit of a mixed bag. Against some high leadership armies they won't really care too much, but against some armies it can be very problematic. And perhaps out of the data sheets, the Abominant and Desecrator are perhaps some of the top ones. And mass war dogs certainly seeming particularly strong. I've seen a fair few people running the big Abaddon dog walk, taking the despoiler himself, leading a whole bunch of war dogs. Out of the dread households, House Herpetrax generally seems to be one of the strongest all rounders, a massive melee boost, and helpful survivability upgrade as well. Though Vextrix is pretty reasonable if you're going war dogs for those rerolls. Nightlists do in general tend to be a bit weak against certain armies. Anything that has big anti-tank alpha strikes will really wreck them. You're likely to be having at least some vehicles exposed turn 1, no matter what flavour of them that you're playing. Certain armies like Leagues of Votan, Imperial Guard, Demons and Tyranids generally tend to do quite well into Night Forces. As mentioned, the Dread abilities are great when they work, but pretty bad when they don't. The secondary objectives are kind of okay, maybe just a little bit more so-so than the Imperial versions. In general, I wouldn't say that they're too badly balanced at the moment, still putting in some good Grand Tournament performance. I feel like things might not necessarily improve for them though, if things like Abaddon or Flamers are toned down in the next points update. If they're not really quite good enough to be worth bringing as allies anymore, then that might cost the faction a fair bit. Moving on, we've got the Death Guard. Again, a faction that I rate lower mid-tier, but at 46% inside Games Workshop's win brackets for what they feel is okay, and they have been at least having some tournament performance, four wins in Nephilim, and remains one of the most popular factions in the game, probably partly due to being one of the launch factions of 8th edition and all the people who started them then. I have a feeling that a lot of people have been getting out their Death Guard as well with all those points drops that they had at the Nephilim turn. They got some very meaningful boosts with all the drops that they got, reversing a lot of their previous unneeded nerfs. In general, Death Guard are a very tanky army that relies on a war of attrition, and particularly damage in melee these days more so than range. Their durability is pretty good, toughness 5 and minus 1 damage across most of the army, good saves and imbals on the Terminators, and of course Armour of Contempt. You can't really go too far wrong by putting down a whole bunch of Terminators or Plague Marines on the board, 
Plague Marines are particularly in fashion at the moment since they got all their free gear, and they're just a pretty massive melee threat, as well as being very durable, objective-secured troops as well. They'll do better in combat with their Contagions of Nurgle worsening enemy toughness, and they've got that Flash Outbreak stratagem to get the Contagions plus some Warlord trait debuffs out to enemy units at the front of their army. Can be quite nice off a bloat drone. Besides the Marines and Terminators, they can also bring along some efficient Demon Engine fire support. The bloat drones and the Plague Burst crawlers are probably the pick of them. Some cheap expendable Pox Walkers for objectives and doing actions and things. They've got some nice stratagem support such as regenerating them and dealing mortal wounds as well. And perhaps for ways to play them, things like Mortarian's Anvil and the Inexorable are fairly popular. And also the Terminus S Strike Force. They've also got a good secondary in Spread the Sickness, which doesn't hurt either. As for downsides, their mobility is really limited, probably one of the worst factions in the game, and the enemy army might have a good few turns to operate and do what they like, as they don't really have that much damage outside of melee. If the enemy just does have enough raw damage outputs to hoover a squad or two off objectives, then it could still be a bad time for the Death Guard. They particularly don't like mass mortal wounds, which don't care about the minus one damage or their other barriers. Moving on, we're getting well and truly into Space Marine territory now, and we're sticking with the Blood Angels, Currently the best performing Space Marine chapter in Nephilim, with a win percentage around about 46%, and winning 3 GTs. Again, they're at least fairly popular as armies go, the ninth most played faction in Nephilim. Marines in general are quite popular, Blood Angels are as well, and if you want to play Space Marines at the moment, they're certainly one of the strongest. I guess in theory, with a bunch of aggressive assault units, they might have got at least some benefit from Games Workshop amping up shock tactics that secondary, though even then I think it's still a bit take or leave compared with other options. Overall, Blood Angels are really quite a simplistic army right now, I think. They're kind of carried by the good chaps tactic and doctrine for some massive melee power, and they're at least fairly easy to deliver into melee with extra boosts to advance and charge, plus a whole bunch of their units getting jump packs. Since the points drop, the Codex has basically been about Sanguinary Guard all around. Almost all lists take a few meaty squads of those, and then buff them with things like Sanguinary Priests, Sanguinary Ancients and Dante, all of which do their own things. Dante helps out with damage, the Ancient can make their jump packs faster with a relic, and the Priest can resurrect them and also give them Assault Doctrine early. They've also got some good Warlord traits, one for a save against mortal wounds, and one to cancel enemy obsec, which is quite nice to pair with Rites of War. In general, supporting them with just about anything else melee works, Assault Marines for a bit more grunt work and bullying enemy light infantry, and perhaps squads of Death Company with Thunder Hammers to jump forward with Forlorn Fury and crack the enemy with a big Alpha Strike. Despite all this, they still only get to a 46 win percentage apparently, the army is perhaps a little bit one-dimensional, a lot of their stratagems and psychic powers and other choices are a bit on the underwhelming side, it generally is Codex Sanguinary Guard with some support. It does mean that they often have some fairly solid counters as well, they don't like mortal wounds, they don't like boards where they're going to be more exposed, minus one damage really messes them up, things like Imperial Knight Armagers or Death Guard won't get on with that, or any mass damage to weapons can generally clear out their infantry pretty efficiently. At the moment I'd say that marines in general need a bit of a lift, but certainly a lot of the Blood Angels unique units could afford to get dropped in points by quite a bit. Things like their Dreadnoughts and the Baal Predator aren't exactly used very much in competitive play, nor are most of their characters. Moving on from Angry Marines to Psychic Marines, we have the Grey Knights. They're in 7th place, and are considerably weaker on the win percentage at around about 42% over the last couple of months. They've not had a lot of success on the top tables either, with just a single GT win in Nephilim, and have fairly low representation as well. They're the 16th most popularly played faction in 40k, far lower than, say, things like Death Guard or Blood Angels. Grey Knights certainly seem to have felt the sting of the Codex creep. They were one of the strongest factions in the game on drop, mainly centred around big squadrons of Dread Knights marching around and deleting things with shooting and psychic. Since the Grandmaster Dread Knights got restricted, they didn't get Armour of Contempt, and they also went up in points a bit. Grey Knight lists tend to be a lot more infantry focused now, maybe more bigger use of Interceptors and Strike Squads and Paladins, the last of which can be very very tough to take out with their Armoured Resilience spell plus Armour of Contempt and maybe an Apothecary. Grey Knights definitely do have their advantages, they've got loads of psychic powers and can spam out a bunch of mortal wounds, and they have, do have protection to the same themselves, which is pretty handy in ninth. A fair few of their units are kind of slow when they're on the board, but they do have some very nice teleport tricks, allowing you to shunt units around the board and hit the foes at unexpected angles, either with stratagems or gate of infinity. They've got a nice secondary objective in their ritual one, and they've got a good cast of supporting characters, with things like Grandmaster Drago, 
a librarian that can put out a fairly hefty amount of mortal wounds each turn, and particularly stacked up Grandmaster Nemesis Dread Knights, dealing a lot of damage and then teleporting away with that sigil of exigence. For the Brotherhoods, the Prescient Brethren and the Rapiers seem to be the most popular at the moment, the option for rerolls and things, and fairly massive melee damage respectively. Obviously, this doesn't seem to be coming together for them quite as well at the moment. I think they are in need of a bit of a buff. A lot of their data sheets just aren't really all that outstanding and are fairly easy to delete. Otherwise, for faction weaknesses in general, having a whole load of focus on psychic can be a bit of an Achilles heel. You can take up all the witch against them quite reliably, and anything with good psychic denial can make them very underwhelming. I feel like they could reasonably get a few points buffs. You could probably put the Dread Knights back down to where they were before, seeing as they don't have Armour of Contempt anymore and I suspect that the troops' terminators could also lose another point or two. They've been solidly outcompeted by the strike squads for most of this edition. Moving on, and we're very much sticking in Space Marine land with Dark Angels. Their win percentage is really quite similar to the Grey Knights, 42% and 3 grand tournament wins, and it seems that really not a lot of people are putting their Unforgiven on the table these days, getting even less players than the Grey Knights. Currently, at least, there does seem to be a bit more variation in the list styles that Dark Angels are bringing, Previously, it tended to be just literally all Deathwing, and that still definitely exists, though people do seem to have been having just about equal success with Ravenwing lists these days. The points drops to Black Knights do seem to have been enough to get them over the line, and encourage people to build around them as a whole thing. I'm not really too surprised to see the Dark Angels as the next Divergent chapter after the Blood Angels. Their Codex supplement was a very powerful one, lots of really good special rules that seem to be equal or better to a lot that the other chapters can bring, really good psychic powers for things like full rerolls, or fighting last, strong warlord traits, and the vast majority of their unique choices seem very, very playable. Then you've got the option of unique vanguard and outrider detachments to get the Deathwing and the Ravenwing objective secured as well, plus refund your command points without the need for troops, and you could throw in some plasma units somewhere, maybe some black knights or interceptors to use weapons of the Dark Age on. In Nephilim, their secondary objectives, which were previously one of their biggest strengths, have got quite drastically reined in. They do struggle on that a lot more now, and the Deathwing Terminators, while still tanky, are maybe just not really outstandingly so. They've got a lot of rivals for that similar role, and perhaps a little bit less durable than things like a well-supported squad of Chaos Terminators now. The Deathwing's main advantage is being slow and easy to outmaneuver, the Ravenwing is just that most of them aren't really all that tough, perhaps. At least they're doing better than most Space Marine chapters, but again, certainly on the lower end of 40k's power spectrum, could do with a bit of a shot in the arm. Moving on, and best friends of the Dark Angels, or so I understand, are the Space Wolves. The Sons of Ross are following only just behind the Unforgiven, with a win rate of about 41%, though haven't been doing quite as well on the top tables, not winning a single GT so far that I could find. It does look like they've been doing okay at a bunch of smaller tournaments and things, and have been placing on podiums and big ones as well, just no one seems to have quite achieved an outright win yet. At least numbers-wise, they do seem to be in a fairly similar state to the Dark Angels, played very slightly less than them, obviously still another good chapter that's got plenty going for it. In terms of their army strength, perhaps like the Blood Angels, one of the main ones are just massive amounts of melee damage with their chapter tactic and doctrine. They've got plenty of ways that they can access Savage Fury early as well, between spells and stratagems. Their psychic phase in general is quite strong, also with the option for a Fight's Last spell and a couple of others. They can also hand out Fight's Last with the Armour of Ross or potentially Judicius with a big heroic intervention too. Very powerful for dictating the flow of combat. In terms of strong choices for the army, a lot of people seem to be running Wolfen these days with the drop in their points. They're at least fairly cheap and very destructive for the cost now. And other good choices are Sky Claws, Wolf Guard with Lightning Claws and Jump Packs, and Long Fangs dropping down out of a drop pod and using their stratagem to ignore the modifiers. If you take their successor combo, which is often taken with Whirlwinds of Rage and Born Heroes, then that gives you a lot more melee damage. Plus, it gives you the option of trying to get double exploding sixes with anything with four rerolls. So, if you upgrade someone to a chapter master or hand out four rerolls with chaplain litanies, you can get your melee damage to some pretty crazy levels. If you go in pure space wolves, though, then I feel like some of their character dreadnoughts are perhaps some of the biggest reasons to do that. Beyond the Fell Handed and Murder Fang are both pretty destructive for the cost. As for downsides, certainly the raw strength of the Space Marine Codex at the moment won't be helping but delivering units to melee can be an issue for them, maybe more so than the Blood Angels, and then maybe not having quite the raw amount of toughness that you need to survive in 9th edition when the enemy strikes back against the unit. Maybe just another couple of other problems compared with other chapters are their warlord traits are quite limited, getting the saga things can be a bit annoying, and they're locked out of taking apothecaries, a unit that they'd really quite like to be able to access to resurrect their powerful infantry. 
Again, probably an army that just needs Codex Space Marines itself to get a whole bunch of buffs. I feel like a lot of their unique stuff is really quite usable, but Marines in general are having a rough time. Moving on for the fourth weakest faction, we have Black Templars. Again, they're one point behind the Space Wolves at 40% overall, but have done better on the top podiums of GTs, winning three in Nephilim. For a more divergent Space Marine chapter, the Black Templars are one of the lesser followed ones. It appears that out of this list at least, they're the second least played faction in Nephilim. I feel like in general, Black Templars are perhaps pushed a bit to make a fairly similar sort of list. Powerful foot melee troops backed up by lightly Grimaldus and Hellbrett. Use that nice 5 plus feel no pain type litany on one of the units, and maybe increase the durability of their combat troops even more with things like the squad relics, which can give you various different durability upgrades, and potentially can be even revived with an apothecary. Besides that, they've got a bit of mortal wound protection across the army, good melee and some flexible vowels that can vary depending on the opponent, and a few other fun things like the Crusader Helm or the Tannhauser's Bones Chaplain. He can be a character that's just very hard to bring down. Out of their unique units, I feel like the Crusader squad troops are by far the pick of the bunch. They're locked into bigger squads, but they're quite reasonable for getting buffs, and they're pretty efficient compared with Assault Intercessors now that they get a whole bunch of their gear free. Again, just basically need a few Space Marine data sheets to get a bit of a power boost, and they'll probably be a lot better. They're definitely an interesting way to build a Space Marine army, and really aren't far behind armies like Dark Angels or Space Wolves within the various Divergent Space Marine chapters. Otherwise, I guess for specific weaknesses for them, they don't really have as many range synergies compared with a few other chapters, even the Space Wolves get a bit more. Plus, I feel like one of their best attributes, their 5 plus Imbol save vow, is just a little bit less relevant in the era of Armour of Contempt. Generally, you need to be hit by AP-4 before it becomes relevant. Moving on once more, and in third place for arguably the weakest army in 40k, we have Death Watch. Their win percentage is 39%. They've won three GTs in Nephilim, though I guess in terms of top tournament performance, that really isn't too bad, considering it does look like they're the least popular faction in Nephilim, unless you divide up the Codex Space Marine chapters into their individual parts, with things like Raven Guard and Iron Hands. I feel like low player rates and a pretty rubbish win percentage, but some decent performances at big events maybe puts them as a faction that's maybe hard to play but get kind of good when they're masters, even if their overall raw power level isn't enormously great in the first place. Death Watch do operate really quite differently to other chapters. They've got objective secured troops with some really interesting unit mixes that you can build. Say, for example, aggressive melee units jumping forward with vanguard veterans and bikes mixed up within the unit, or having interesting combos of Phobos marines to hold other places, say taking a whole bunch of eliminators perhaps. In particular, I feel like Kill Team Strike Force Army of Renown is one of the better ways to play the faction at the moment. That one gives you some interesting abilities like nicking different space marines chapter tactics for a turn, Say having everyone charge forward with white scars advance and charge is quite nice, and it's got a spectacularly big damage dealing stratagem that costs a bunch of CP, but basically lets one of your kill teams bypass the wound roll against their ideal target, guaranteed to stack a bunch of damage. Otherwise, they've got decent psychic with a 5 plus feel no pain type spell, and a fairly nice melee buff as well. Flexible doctrine, so you can get the assault doctrine early if you should so desire, and some fairly good close range shooting. I must admit the special issue ammunition mechanic is really quite underwhelming to what it was last edition. Otherwise, the various different kill teams can be teleported around the board with that Beacon Angelis, which is quite a nice way to get them where they need to be. And if you aren't going down the infantry-based kill team strike force, you could maybe go for a Dreadnought Castle. Death Watch do that kind of build perhaps some of the best out of anyone. A 5 plus Imbol save on a bunch of Redemptors from that Relic Shield of theirs plus things like full rerolls against one data sheet for a turn is really brutal with Volkite Contemptors. Generally speaking, unless you're deliberately going for faster units, they'll usually be quite a slow army to get to grips with the enemy, maybe relying on teleporting to get forward, or hoping that the enemy comes within a long charge range for advance and charge with borrowing the White Scars tactic. Again, they'd certainly be helped out by Space Marine Codex getting a bit of a power boost, and if you were to make the Death Watch faction stronger in general, I feel like a buff to their special issue ammunition would definitely be welcomed by Death Watch players. That was quite a fun mechanic that seems pretty lacklustre right now. Still though, despite being in a rough spot, I do feel like it's at least a little bit of a point in Games Workshop's favour that perhaps the least popular faction with a pretty rubbish win percentage can still win multiple grand tournaments within a season. You definitely wouldn't have had this sort of thing happening in the vast majority of 9th edition so far. Moving onwards and slightly downwards once more, we have the various Codex Space Marine chapters, so these are the ones that are a bit more Codex compliant and don't go off with a whole bunch of their unique random different units. For clarity, the ones being talked about here are Ultramarines and White Scars, Raven Guard, Iron Hands, Salamanders and Imperial Fists and their various successors. 
Their win percentage at the moment is around about 38% well low of Games Workshop's target of 45, and they have said themselves that they basically do need some buffs, and will almost certainly be getting some support in the next chapter approved with the points updates. They did say just very slightly infamously in one of their MetaWatch articles that the win rates may be kept a bit low by newer players, and maybe people who play a bit more casually. And to be fair, I think that that's probably true to a little bit of an extent. You're less likely to have people jump from chapter to chapter with Space Marines as opposed to other factions, and have people just stick with the one that they like the lore of, say if you just love Imperial Fist or Raven Guard, and you'll keep on trying to make them work. While that might explain a percentage point or two though, it's hardly the whole story, given this low of a win percent. Space Marines are just pretty underpowered at the moment, despite all of the things that they had going for them at the start of the edition. In terms of tournament performance, they've won three GTs in Nephilim, two of which were Iron Hands, and one of which was Ultramarines. Iron Hands in particular will probably be the Space Marine chapter that I rate within these Codex chapters as the strongest. They've got a whole bunch of synergies with shooting, can actually make the vehicles do some decent work, and if you take successor chapters and things, they can also be pretty savage in melee as well. They even have a stratagem for extra strength. If you combine the various Codex Space Marine chapters together, I believe that you get them to be the 8th most popular faction at the moment. So it's not like they're not being played at all, but the fact that they're being played quite so regularly and have only got 3 GT wins does maybe say something about their strength. Interestingly, if you wanted to lump all the Divergent chapters in with the Space Marine Codex as well, then they'd wind up being the third most popular faction at the moment, with a win rate of around about 41%, Blood Angels doing a fair bit of work to drag them upwards. I feel like Space Marines are almost certainly going to be an army to watch though, Games Workshop have promised updates for them at the next balance pass. It was just a bit of a joke that they gave them a small boost to one secondary objective at the last one. My guess would be that really quite a lot of units get a points buff of one sort or another. The Codex Space Marine chapters are also rumoured to be getting updated supplements as well, which going by 9th edition trends would generally be a power boost, but I guess we'll have to wait and see on that front. The Gilliman profile that got leaked looked like maybe a bit of a side grade, though if he can buff more Imperium units, then he might be good for other things even outside Space Marines. Anyway, all that aside, strengths-wise, Codex Space Marines have a pretty awesome unit choice, almost 100 data sheets within their Codex, so they can generally take the right tools for the job, and then having their own supplement Codexes, it actually does push you in different ways to build the army quite effectively, say with some units being far far better in Iron Hands or White Scars or something, than they might have been in a different chapter. Armour of Contempt's definitely made a lot of pretty rubbish data sheets a lot more usable again, but it doesn't seem to have been enough to actually get the Space Marine chapters competing with the best of the armies right now. In terms of raw powers of data sheets, the Redemptor Dreadnoughts, Eradicators, Vanguard Veterans, and Drop Pod Devastators are perhaps some of the pick of the bunch. Maybe supported with a few incursors or something in the troop slot to take those midfield points, and then maybe fill out more choices depending on what chapter you're taking. In terms of the individual chapter win rates, it looks like it's Iron Hands, then Salamanders leading the show at the moment. Iron Hands around about 44%-ish, so arguably if they were counted as their own standalone thing, they would rate higher than a few of the other Divergent chapters. Most of the rest are around about the 38% mark, and then Imperial Fists are far far worse at the moment. They've been languishing with less than a 30% win rate for the vast majority of 9th. Overall, I feel like it is mainly Codex creep that hasn't helped Space Marines. When Games Workshop has done balance updates for them, their buffs have generally targeted some of the worst units in the Codex, and generally just made things like bad tanks very slightly less bad, rather than actually giving them any meaningful power boosts to the units that were already usable. They've also got a fair amount of competition from the Divergent chapters, maybe a fair bunch of Space Marine players might just jump ship and play as them for a while. And the Space Marine secondary objectives certainly aren't easy as well. The very easy Oaths of Moment one got drastically toned down, and I think a bit more help on that front also wouldn't go amiss. Finally, last, and on this list arguably least, we have the Tech Priests and Skitari of the Adeptus Mechanicus, arguably the weakest army in 40k right now, though with a win rate of 38%, kind of arguably joint bottom with Space Marines perhaps. The Admech though have got 0 GT wins when the Space Marines have had 3, so if we're going for a tiebreaker, I guess that would be it. The Admex certainly had a massive heyday in early 9th edition, with their armies just hoovering other factions off the board when their codex dropped, but after a few nerfs and the vast majority of the codex just catching up in terms of power level, their fortunes have really gone from being great to kind of broken to one of the worst armies in the game, or within one edition. Currently not a lot of people are choosing to play them, they're the third least played army in Nephilim in general. Only Black Templars and Death Watch edge them out for that, and even Gene Stealer Cult has more players. It is kind of interesting that Games Workshop did do something at least slightly meaningful for the Admech in the balanced data slate. They got rid of the nerf that stopped their Vanguard auto wounding on 4 pluses with a stratagem with their Radium Carbines. That was a bit of a terror of the Codex when the book first dropped, 
weirdly being an army that could almost hoover Mortarion off the board in a round of shooting. Undoing that nerf, I think, is a reasonable power boost to the faction. I think you'd usually want to include a big block of vanguard for the option to use that. Very handy against certain armies. Certainly big chaos demons and things would not like to be on the receiving end. They also undid a Lucius nerf as well, which means they can stack their saves slightly higher if they want to. Overall though, as best I can tell, these changes don't really seem to have impacted the win rate significantly. It looks like they were around about 37-38% to 38 before, and they still seem to be around about the same numbers after, at least by the data that we have so far. Realistically, I think this will have helped them out a bit, but usually changing one stratagem isn't exactly going to propel an army from being kind of rubbish to kind of good. The Admet Codex certainly has proved itself that it can be very competitive in 40k, the units just need the right points. They can stack a whole bunch of synergies on certain units, getting more and more damage output or durability, like very high save Skitari or very dangerous ones, bringing different sources of things together, things like Warlord traits, ignores cover, and character buffs. After their units at present, it's generally about the Skitari. Rust Stalkers are excellent melee troops and can move very, very far with the Skitari veteran cohort. Iron Striders are some pretty scary core firepower and again can take some of the great Admech buffs. Their last cannons and auto cannons are both very usable, and the Skitari troops are also pretty central to the faction. That veteran cohort formation is pretty handy as well, giving them 5 plus invul saves and things as well as access to some more flexible Doctrina Imperatives and some nice stratagems to support. For the Forge Worlds, I'd say that Mars and Lucius are perhaps some of the strongest. Lucius for the teleporting delivery of the Skitari troops, and Mars is just generally strong, overlapping the Doctrinas and the Canticles. Obviously, being arguably the weakest faction in the game, they've got plenty of issues. The arm is pretty complex, and it's a bit more of a headache to play than plenty of the others. Particularly with the melee units, there's a fair few moving parts that you need to try and have in the right place, as some of their buffs are maybe a little bit limited in range. The secondaries going into Nephilim are generally pretty awful. That certainly won't help them either, as they'll struggle to score compared with their rivals. The raw power of their units generally isn't particularly good outside of stacking buffs and things. Most of their best units went up in points reactively to them doing well, and only a few of them have come down a bit since. A lot of their Court Mechanicus type units were just pretty bad out of the Codex in the first place, and Games Workshop hasn't really given them meaningful buffs either. Finally, Admech I think hate Nephilim in particular due to the amount of CP that they usually want to spend pre-game. They want to buy in their squad relics and warlord traits and stat their characters high. Only having 6 CP to be able to do so is pretty painful, and that's been another thing that's greatly reduced their power in this season. At least for the next update, it does look like they're squarely in Games Workshop's radar, one of the lowest win percentages in the game, and now they've reversed all their balanced data slate nerfs and things, hopefully they'll be able to actually look at which units need buffs and things, give them some points reductions, or maybe change their faction special rules slightly, like messing with the canticles of the Omnis Hire or something. That could be a couple of different ways that they could go, as well as some better secondaries. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed a bit of a breakdown of the lower end of the 40k meta right now, and maybe a little discussion as to how the armies can still do okay, or how Games Workshop might be able to buff them in the future. Here's some overall rankings, both in terms of win percentage and the amount of grand tournaments they've won. Admech happily taking the top spots in both cases. Otherwise, for win percentage, it's Admech, Codex Space Marines, Death Watch, Black Templars, Space Wolves, Dark Angels, Grey Knights, Blood Angels, Death Guard, then Chaos Knights, with Orcs and Gene Steeler Cult not being too far behind. Then on the tournament wins, we've got Admech and the Space Wolves with zero, Grey Knights with just the one, Gene Steeler Cult and Drakari with two. Drakari and Miss Lee have also very, very low players, but their win rate is pretty decent with 49% to be fair. And then a whole bunch of Space Marines all on three wins each, Black Templars, the Codex Marines, Death Watch, Dark Angels, and Blood Angels. So anyway, let me know your thoughts. Are these guys feeling like the right choices for the weakest armies in 40k right now? And if so, how would you think about buffing them when Games Workshop's next balance pass comes out? If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to check out the equivalent for the top 10 strongest armies. That one's got a similar style, looking at the same sort of statistics for perhaps the top armies in the game, and what's making them good at the moment. Finally, if you've enjoyed the video, I would just like to quickly mention that Auspex Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that link down in the video description if you're interested in helping support future videos. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with the chance to win some really big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help keep these videos coming, feel free to check out the link in the video description below. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.